Welcome back to the Spew Avenue Show. You know, hope does spring eternal. It's that time of year. We're all excited about the Detroit Tigers season. Certainly, I am just, no matter how good they are, I always care. But there seems to be sort of these divided camps. The, there's divergent paths with the fan base here in Detroit. I, I think I'm more on one side than the other. Color you shocked that I'm a little bit more cynical. I want to get into this, though. First of all, Let's just look at the fan uh, fan graphs projected standings, Ben, for the AL Central. Not a great picture. They seem to agree with the masses. It's kind of a three-man race up top. Kansas City trailing a little behind. But fan graphs has the Tigers, 79 wins this year. So comfortably out of the playoffs, but within arm's reach, right? Okay, next one, Ben. Let's take a look at this. Where's the money going with this team's payroll? This team's payroll is at $95 million. And look at the top of the list here. Look at the players that constitute this $95 million. You have obviously Javi Baez at the top, $25 million. Flaherty, ERA of five last year in second. Maeda, I think, is actually solid. Canna, solid. Cabrera. Everyone thinks Cabrera's off the books. No, he's on the hook for $8 million this year, the Tigers are. You look at the picture, it's not that pretty. So you start with them at $95 million, which, by the way, Ben, we got that graphic in here next, too. Where does that rank against the average? $57.3 million below the MLB average. You have a $95 million payroll, which is, I mean, an appalling number. And we just gave you the breakdown on the prior slide there. It's not only is it a piss-poor payroll, but the guys that are constituting that payroll are either Javi Baez, who's dead, and Miguel Cabrera, who's retired. Those two alone, Ben, throw that up. We got that one in the rotation. (laughs) Look at at this. 34.7% of that already almost 60 million below average payroll is going to Javi Baez and Miguel Cabrera's $8 million buyout. So I understand the optimism But if you do believe in the analytics, the analytics don't paint the Tigers favorably in terms of projections. It doesn't look all that pretty. I think it's fair to ask, uh, what are they doing in 2024? Because even if you believe the cynical view and you're in the fan grasp perspective, they're going to finish five back in the division and they're not spending anything. I would argue it's unacceptable in year eight of a rebuild. And I don't care that they replace the GM, the ownership, it's the same family. I'm bringing in the legend, Tony Paul, who, by the way, I was told by Ben, this is your record seventh appearance now. This You, you broke the tie with Chris Castellani, so welcome back to you, and congratulations on that honor. Thank you. That's why I showed up, So just, I, to, just to take this title. I, I listened to your podcast, Detroit News Tigers podcast, with Chris McCoskey today, and I believe you recorded it today. Mm-hmm. You guys, I, I listened to it, informative, a lot of good stuff about the, you know, who's playing well in spring training and all that. But you're way more optimistic than I am. And both you guys are. Where am I wrong? Where is Fangraphs wrong? Are, are you pleased with where they're at and the investment? Like, is the team back them enough? Can, kind of take me through where you're at with it. Well, I mean, Fangraphs is great and the analytics are great. Um, they, I mean, that it's not going to be what it is at the end of the year. I mean, we all know that. It's, you know, you they play, nailed it last year. They were within a, like a game with all of the teams. Well, with the Tigers. Well, there you go. I mean, it's... Yeah, yeah. Look, I have some optimism on two levels. And I'll start by saying that the payroll thing bothers me. I'm not going to give a pass on that. I mean, they're, 100, they're under $100 million. We just saw before we went on the air tonight that the Arizona Diamondbacks just signed Jordan Montgomery for $25 million for one year. Any of the 30, teen, or, you know, 30 teams could have done that, including the Tigers. The Diamondbacks have a payroll of $175 million, and the Tigers, you know, um, arguably a more vibrant sports market in Detroit, um, under 100. So I'm not going to give them a pass on that. I don't like that. But um, it's a lousy division that is there for the taking. You can put the Twins up top. I don't like a whole lot about the Twins. I don't think they did. I don't think any of the teams in the division this year really went crazy in the offseason. If you look at it, they didn't. I don't really like the Twins as some team that's going to, you know, run off three or four central titles in a row. They got the Guardians up there. I don't really like them all that much. Um, the Royals have a long way to go to make up from all the losses they had, and the White Sox are a complete debacle. So you start with the division, and I think that it's there for the taking. Start with that. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, and then um, as I mentioned on the podcast today, if you look 
at all the rotations. Everyone in the Central, I like the Tigers the best on paper. I know you could say that about Flaherty. I think that there's definite potential for a, a, a rebound season from him, uh, from everything they're saying down in Lakeland, from what everyone's seeing. Kenta Maeda, I think, is a good presence here. I think Tarek Scoble is an ace. I think Casey Mize is looking really, really good. And uh, so, I and I mean, I mean, it's a rotation that's decent enough that Matt Manning didn't make it. I mean, I, you know, so I like that. Um, offense is a concern. It's a big concern. But in this division, I, I think it's there for the taking. They they took every series, season series in the Central last year, and I think they're a better team, even though they didn't go crazy with the payroll. Ben, can you throw that breakdown of the backup with was it the top ten guys on the payroll or whatever it is when you get a chance? Because here's part of my issue, and we know there's young guys not making that much. Torkelson and Green. the best players aren't on that list. That's true, but like when you break this down, Baez is a guy that everyone was hoping he'd opt out or just would retire. Or well, something. he wasn't ever going to opt out. Well, I agree, <laughs> but we were hoping for miracles. So, but bottom line is they don't want him there. Jack Flaherty's here on a one-year deal. Maeda's thirty-six on a two-year deal. Canna's on a one-year deal. Cabrera's retired. Chafin's on a one-year deal. Carson Kelly, I think, is a one-year deal. Shelby Miller's a one-year deal. It, it's a bunch of retired guys, one-year deal guys, and Maeda's, Maeda's the only multi-year guy on there other than Baez, who no one wants here. Point being, what, what is the core of this team? Because you can say the young guys, that's fine. The payroll is what? It's going to be fifty million in a year. No. I don't like. It seems like a, a bunch of stop gaps. Is that not a fair criticism? Well, it's reinforcements. I think. I think, and, it, and in a lot of ways, it, it is stop gaps from guys that they aren't convinced are ready to come up right now, uh, and they they think that they will be either later in this season or next season. Uh, but again, you look at that list, and their best players aren't on there. I mean, it's yeah, you can look at that. And Javi Baez' contract's a disaster. I like I like the signing. I hate the signing now. I mean, I was wrong. It's been a disaster, and everyone says, oh, you know, he's changed his approach, and he's doing this, and he's doing that. I don't buy that he's going to be an impact player for this team. Um, you know, it's a disaster. It is what it is. They got four years left on that deal. They're not cutting him today with $98 million left. It is what it is. But you look at that list, there's no Spencer Torkelson. There's no Riley Green. There's no Kerry Carpenter. There's no Colt Keith. There's no Jake Rogers. I mean, um, there's no Casey Mize. Uh, there's no Tariq Skubal. I mean, it's their best players aren't on there yet because it's a young core. But, um, you know, they get some veteran guys in there on the one-year deals. I think that, I think Flaherty will help. I think Maeda will help. Um, I think that uh, there's some, you know, Chafin, I think, helps the bullpen. Shelby Miller, I think, helps the bullpen. So, um, you know, I think there are stop gaps for next year. And if you look around, the Keith Laws of the world or the Kylie McDaniels of the world with the prospects, they like the Tigers' farm system. And because the Tigers' farm system is as deep as it's probably been in decades, um, according to these guys, um, you know, that's why you're seeing the stop gaps. It was a 2019 Tigers, I think, at the number two pay, uh, number two uh, farm system. I mean, I, I think they were number two in all baseball, and I think it was 2019. I'm positive they were second, like, give or take a year in there. I, I look, I understand the point, but that my point is not to say, oh, look at the best guys on the team. We all know those guys aren't on there, but I couldn't you make the argument that look, your payroll is so bad. And the payroll that it that's accounted for there is a bunch of bad players or retired guys or one year stopgap guys. No, I'm not defending the payroll. I'm making the argument though, they have no excuse not to have spent more. And it going forward, and we'll get into more kind of season preview y stuff, but like Juan Soto is a free agent this upcoming offseason. What excuse do they have not to offer him forty five million dollars a year? Ten four fifty. Because that's not their philosophy. And I agree with you. I mean, I don't know what you want me to say. You can roll your eyes at what I'm saying. I'm, I'm saying, not at you. I'm saying them. It's at them. I mean, they could, you know, I mean, they weren't going to sign Shohei Otani, and they weren't, they're not going to sign Juan Soto. I mean, it is what it is. It's just not what they're going to do. Apparently, we've learned this. What? Where? Okay. So they're, they're ranking. I mean, one of us has them at 22, one has them at 23. They're around 23rd payroll the in this year. They're, yep. And they are, as we, Demonstrated almost sixty million below average. Below but I'm third with most of the central too. It, it's a joke. Yeah. It, but the problem is, it's not in a vacuum. They've been bottom third, even with the Cabrera extension, for years. The last what seven or eight year run, we did it on the show at one point. I think it's seven years in a row where they've had a bottom like twelve payroll. They've been below league average. At, at some point, like I'm willing to. Okay, we're rebuilding. We're going to have a low payroll for five years. I'm patient. I've been patient, in my opinion. 
what is the plan here? Because you're saying that's not their philosophy. Well, I mean, they've proven it. I mean, it's just not what Chris Illich is going to do. Shouldn't we be mad about that? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. <I> mean, <laughs> all, all right. What do you want me to say? I mean, uh, they shouldn't have a bottom third payroll. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a big enough market. It's a storied franchise. It's a team that, you know, a decade ago was coming off. It's, you know, a great sustained stretch of, of baseball. Um, no, it shouldn't be. Um, I'm not saying you need to go spend the 230 million or 20 million that Mike Illich did. I don't think that that's, you know, that's fine. If you want to run it by like a business, it's okay that you can run a business like a business. If you want to make money and that is the goal, that's fine. Mike Illich didn't care about making money. He wanted to win a world series and he would spend until the day he died to do it. And that's what he did. Um, and fell up and fell short. Chris isn't going to do that. Um, you know, you can go with the bottom line, but you can make money by spending more than $95 million with this, with this franchise, um, with the TV money in baseball. Um, you know, there's, there's plenty of money to go around to spend more than that in the market of Detroit, especially when you know that a good product on, on the field at Comerica park is going to make this town go bananas as it did for eight years or whatever the stretch was. So no, they should be spending. Yeah. I'm not saying you have to go crazy and you know, they're not going to be the, you know, in the, you know, they weren't in the Otani market. They're not going to be in the Soto market, but when you look, my problem with this offseason was when you look at the team and the division, and you look at what they did in the they 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 took the season series from every team in the division last year. That means something. I mean, I think that means they're a decent ball club that should contend in this division. And it, when it's there for the taking, and it's right there for the taking, I think you have to do more than just a ninety five million dollar payroll when they're especially with this offseason market that was so bad for free agents, especially toward the end. I mean, again, Jordan Montgomery, $25 million, but you look J.D. Martinez, $12 million of the Mets. J.D. Martinez could have come here, hit 30 home runs with 80 RBIs. You can almost pencil that in. He's a beloved figure here. He loved it here. Um, and that would have helped their offense, which was third worst in baseball last year. As much progress as they made, their offense was not good. Um, even with the strides of Torkelson and the strides of, you know, Green and what you saw from Parker Meadows. <laughs> Um, you know, you add Mark Hanna. Okay, well, J.D. Martinez is a sure thing for those numbers. And 12 million bucks, he probably could have done that. You could have maybe taken a look at Chapman for 30. Don't really have a third baseman. Uh, Gio Urshela is, you know, not going to be the guy, you know, that's going to put you over the top offensively at third base. So there were options to where you didn't have to blow the bank to upgrade the offense. Uh, and they chose not to do it. And Scott Harris can talk about the process and that's fine. He is new, whatever. Um, I just think that when it, the division's that close and Chris and I debated this on the podcast today, which you can check out DetroitNews.com. Um, but we debated it and, you know, Chris said, well, the, ob the object's not just to win the central. And I don't agree with that because I don't think you, you can't do anything until you, you know, win the central and get into the playoffs. You can win a wild card, but the wild card's not coming out of the central. We all know that. Um, unless, you know, some team has a, a wildly unexpected season, but you get into the playoffs. I mean, you know, Diamondbacks made a run last year. You, you never know. I mean, baseball is not a sport where there are no upsets in the playoffs. So you get in and you never know. Yeah. I mean, then you mentioned the Diamondbacks that you threw the Diamondbacks at them and he said, Oh, well, those are all young guys. They're not all young. Christian if their payroll Walker, is $175 million. Well, I mean, Christian Walker's like with 31, 32 last year. Catal Marte is like 29, 30 last year. I mean, they're not all young guys. I mean, baseball is a sport where you get in. It's, it's hockey in, in a lot of ways, too. I mean, you get in and you have a chance if you get in. And um, and when it's that close, spending another, you know, they say, all right, we don't want to sign JD because we don't want to block and we don't want to have a full time DH and whatever. You're not signing JD for 10 years. You know, you're, you're not blocking someone for the rest of their career and have to trade somebody. You're looking at your offense. That's the issue with this team. They made progress last year. Their pitching staff, even with losing Eduardo Rodriguez, like uh, the rotation, I honestly believe is better. And so you look at the offense could be better and uh, one piece could maybe be the difference. I mean, I think JD Martinez healthy might have been the difference. Um, to win this division, so I mean, you mentioned Chapman and JD. They they're clearing thirty million dollars on the on the button this year. They could have signed those deals. They'd be twenty seven point three million blows league average still. I, that's why I said you don't. I don't. You didn't have to blow the bank. Um, I I just thought there were options that you know you could take. You could have gone into spring training, looked at your team, said, "All right, we're okay," uh, but if we just add a little piece here and. You know, I'm saying only a little piece with JD because he only got $12 million from the Mets. 
Um, you know, and, and then JD's on the record of saying, you know, that he didn't want to go to San Francisco because of the ballpark and he, it's not a good hitter's park, especially if you go the other way like he does. And so he feared that he might have a bad year and then his career would be over. Well, where does he know he can hit? He knows he can hit in Detroit. You know, you got to believe JD would have been interested. And I just, I, I felt like for 12 million bucks, I mean, what is that, you know, to upgrade your offense that significantly and maybe put off Justin Henry Malloy for a year or, you know, I, I think it'd be okay. And so, you know, little element of the, the Verlander vibes too, and we were advocating for that. It's, we think they can still play. Right. That's most important, but also a little care to throw the fans too. I mean, not a primary thing I care about, but it's not nothing. It's not nothing. It would be a little bit of sign of goodwill toward the fan base. Exactly. Here, here's a guy that is beloved here. I mean, people still get, I mean, I watched that clip against Chris Sale and I still get chills off that home run. I mean, it was the most just unbelievable scene. Um, I believe, you know, uh, Chris and I debated this uh, on the podcast. I believe JD were to come here um, and the, the Tigers thought differently. They are, uh, they are laser focused on not blocking anybody. And to me, if that's if this is a guy who can post thirty and eighty or ninety RBIs, um, I mean that could get you in the playoffs in this division. Here, here's the problem with the blocking argument, particularly in his case, maybe less with Chapman. On a one year deal, if your argument is I'm going to block somebody if I sign this guy, you better win ninety plus. I don't want to hear it. I mean, right? Because what are you well, blocking? Your deal is the key for me. I don't think how much are you blocking someone on a short term deal like that, especially someone who can maybe put you over the edge in a terrible division. I. I didn't get it. I mean, I'm on Wojo's side here. Wojo wrote a column a few weeks ago advocating for it. Um, but uh, for whatever reason, I mean, they're laser focused on this, you know, um, you know, not, you know, getting these young guys the opportunity. And that's fine. But it's there for the taking. <laughs> like, it's not like the 90s or even when the Tigers were winning the Central in the 2006, you know, six, when they didn't win it. But, you know, when they won it from 2011, 13, I mean, it was a good division then. It's not a good division now. It's it's the worst in baseball by a mile. And uh, this team on paper is better than last year's team um, with the best rotation in the division. And I just don't know how you, you don't invest a little bit, too. It seems like the backbone of your argument is it's mostly rooted in the division sucks. That's and a big part of it. I'm not, I'm not dismissing yeah, it. Like if the Twins were projected to win 97 games, I mean, that's different. This team isn't going to sniff that. I get it. But are, do you, are you awarding them? Like, let's look at it. Let's, I'll, I'll phrase it this way. Do you like what they're doing? Do you buy in, take the divisions out of it, or is this simply a, they might be the, you know, the best bad team? Because like, that's, that's a different argument where I'm going to backdoor in and, hey, you never know, we have a shot. Or on a fundamental principle, baseball level, I like what they're doing with their roster construction and their long-term strategy and view. Where I, are you well, at with that? I, liked a lot. I mean, I like almost all of the young guys projected to make an impact. So I like, and by the way, a lot of those young guys come from the Avila era. So, uh, you know, I mean, it's not all Scott Harris is, you know, doing, but I mean, I mean, I like Riley Green. I like Spencer Torkelson. I think the Colt Keith extension is brilliant. I mean, I think it's finally it's finally a, an executive with the Tigers, you know, playing a little che you know a little chess instead of checkers. You know, um, yeah, I've talked to a couple of people. Even Chris and I argued this. Well, what if he's a bust? Well, if he's a bust, it costs you twenty eight million dollars, which is one year of Hosby bias, basically. <laughs> yeah. And if he's not a bust, you save tens of millions of dollars on the back end. So I, I like that deal. Casey Mize, I I think has a good chance to make have a breakthrough this year. Jackson Job, the reports on him are through the roof. We might see him this summer. Um, but I, I like a lot of their young, the young projections. Parker Meadows is going to be an electric center fielder. And, I mean, so good that Riley Green's a pretty good center fielder and he's not going to be playing center field. Um, so you get better defense out there, which is good for them. But um, yeah, so I like, I like a lot of the young stuff that they're doing. I, I think there's definitely a plan there. But again, um, and you know, and who knows, maybe they'll surprise us next off season. I thought maybe they might this off season, but you know, these teams are built, you know, championship teams are best built from within, but then you supplement. Um, and I just, I'm waiting for the Tigers to supplement. We've argued about this before. The 2006 Tigers were built over a series of three off seasons by free agent signings, uh, significant ones. Um, and I, I don't see the supplement coming, um, to to be to be alongside these young guys at this time and I, I just don't know that you do that all in one off season so 
I'm I'm not exactly on board with that. I'm not on board with a lot of stuff, and I actually I, I pretty much agree with you. I don't think they're going to stink. I think the rotation looks pretty good. I honestly think they're in a, a slightly above average team. They they can't hit. Riley Green has to be healthy. I don't know why I'm supposed to like pencil in for five minute bats. There's no evidence he can stay healthy. If he's healthy somehow. And there's another thing, too. It's like you got the health issue with Riley Green. When he's healthy, he's really good. Yeah. But there's another reason why. Why not bring in JD? You know, I mean, you get, you know, you get reinforcement there in case something goes bad. I mean, I, I just think, I, I don't know. It just bothers me when you're that close. And I think they are that close to contending because that no one's looking at the twins and saying, oh, no one's going to beat the twins. I mean, look at their, no. I mean, they, I mean, okay. They signed Carlos Santana. Congrats. I mean, no one's looking at them going, we can't beat the twins. So when you're that close. I mean, for twelve million bucks, I mean, he probably would have come here. For, Jay probably would have come here for less. I mean, honestly, and uh, I, I don't get it. Yeah, I mean, and the argument with the division being so shitty, all the more reason to spend. It's it's so gettable. Like, why why try to skate by and and sneak in and get it? I, I don't like anything about the strategy, Mike Foley. Well, and, and at its root, uh, and its root, when they don't do things like that, and look. I like the Maeda signing, and again, the Maeda signing is more of a long-term thing. I mean, they've been very open about, you know, one of the reasons they signed him was that they could get in the Japanese market. So, you know, maybe they could build on that in the future because they haven't been in the Japanese market ever since, you know, Hideo Nomo and Masao Kita back in the early 2000s. So, but I like that signing. I, I think the Flaherty thing is a low-risk, high-reward type thing one year. Um, so I like some of the things they did, but... Um, I, I just think he could have done more. I mean, I've been hearing about these pipelines they're building in the Dominican, and they, they never that never ends up materializing. But whatever, you got you got a new guy. Uh, that's, yeah. that's 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 you know you can say that in perpetuity. And Did then, you think Al Avila was going to be the guy that was going to build the international market for the Tigers? He told me he was. But did you think that? No, I think that I, I think <laughs> more, I, I, I think more people believe that Scott Harris has a little bit more infrastructure in place and a little bit more of a vision. A vision on that front. Okay, when the guy cannot get humiliated at the trade deadline, that was, that was not good. I mean, that was not good. Can we not assign this guy? I'm not saying chess player um, status yet. I mean, the Cole Keith. I think the Cole Keith signing was a sign. No, uh, I like I like that for the same reasons you laid out. Valenti <laughs> talked about the Tigers this week. He's he's not pleased with a lot of stuff they're doing. We've mostly aligned on this. I want to play a clip of him. Bet if you can run Valenti, please for us. Matt Chapman was three at 54. JD was one at 12. I, I don't understand in this town how there's no thirst or hunger or desire to ask for more where they could still have a payroll below league average. They could still be doing it on the cheap, but while building for the future, you can make, you can win the division. And yet there's, look at right here. Because all people in this town care about is getting bombed off three foot daiquiris, ripping zins, and maybe going on the Ferris wheel. <laughs> so we've addressed a lot of the front. I don't even think the Ferris wheel still works. Oh, is that busted too? <laughs> Are they replaced the monitors? I mean, that's all basically three? what we we've, we've talked about. I mean, that's I think we were aligned. Well, on that. on that part, I want that part at the end though about the he's frustrated with the fan base. And that's what I want to ask you about. I think that uh, I would say that. I'm not going to totally agree with that because Tiger fans, I think they act with their wallets. I mean, they they don't show up when the team's not good. I mean, they're not they're not sitting there, you know, selling out Comerica Park when the team's not good. I mean, the attendance is terrible. So, um, you know, maybe they're not pounding the pavement, you know, pounding their fists. Um, but uh, I, I think they make their their displeasure known by not going to the park. Do you? Do you feel the Tigers fan base like is on a more positive side now, more negative, more cynical? No, I, the vibe seems more leaning towards positive, I feel like. I don't know. I mean, I I mean it's it's they've well, here's the thing. They've they've lost a part of their fan base. Okay, it's been ten years since they made the playoffs. You remember, you're younger than me, but from eighty from eighty eight to two thousand and five, that the Tigers lost an entire generation of fans. An entire generation. 
that didn't know anything about the team didn't care because they were so bad. They got them back. But now it's been 10 years again where you've been, they've had one winning season in 10 years since they last made the playoffs. They've lost those fans. So I think that's why it maybe doesn't seem as passionate because I think they lost. And when the Tigers are good, they've got, they've got them and there's obviously a lot of passion. But now there's been total apathy. And, that, and I made the argument, you know, before where if the Tigers, like last year we talked about, the Tigers weren't going to contend. But if you're going to suck, at least be interesting, right? At, you know, being interesting and terrible is better than being apathetic with your fans. Because if, you, if the fans are apathetic, you're done. You've lost them completely. So, um, you know, that was my thing last year. Be interesting. And I think they were to, you know, an extent. I think people were interested in them. Um, But it has been 10 years since they made the playoffs. So they've lost a lot of fans that they're going to have to win back. So I think that that's why you're not hearing maybe the, you know, the pounding of the fists and the, you know, the pitchforks is because I think that they've lost some of those fans. Uh, and it shows at the ballpark. I mean, they just they don't show up. But now they're going to show up because there's new TVs at the ballpark. Yeah, well, that's that's the key. I mean, you had them on your podcast, the 87 wins, right? I did have 87. That's and pretty. Now, now that came off the top of my head, and maybe it was a little ambitious. Uh, I think they'll be over 500. How a little about bit. That? I think they're going to be over 500. If they if they are in that, I think what we say, Fangrass had them at 79. If they if they hit that 79 or worse, it's tough to say. They've been just. Bad, battering their fan base over the heads for years at this point as you laid out, but at the same time I, I think it's going to be difficult to recover from another bad year. I just feel like the fan base is in a point where they're they're optimistic for the first time in the last several years, like real optimism, not well, the, there was, the March shit. There was that optimism a few years ago, though. What, where, three, four years ago? Where they fell on their face completely and that cost the Wheeler's job. There was, there was, there was, if you remember back, there was optimism. No, no, I agree. I'm not saying it's been 10 years since there's, I think this is the first time in the last three years that I can recall people being generally positive because they see pieces that are part of the future. Okay. I I think that that's a big reason when you see Spencer Torkelson and and yeah, you can still nitpick about a lot of things with his game, but he did show progress last year. Riley Green's a good player. Kerry Carpenter's a good player. You like, you know, the idea of Keith, Colt Keith. You like the idea of Casey Mize. You like Jackson Joe. You can see these pieces. I don't think you, I, I think it was a little bit of a mirage a few years ago. I don't think you saw those pieces that were supposed to be part, uh, at least that many pieces that were supposed to be part of the future. So I think fans can see the puzzle coming together. Um, I think that there's a lot of fans out there that would like it to come together quicker. And I think it could have. Yeah, I agree. And I, I don't think the optimism is completely. Hairbrained or ridiculous. I mean, they don't have a third baseman. I mean, and you could have had Matt Chapman for nothing. Uh, you know, they, I mean, all due respect to Matt Veerling and Gio Yashella, you don't have a third baseman. You don't have a great offense, at least statistically. You had a chance to, to go get these pieces, but, um, you know, again, Scott Harris is new relatively. It's been two years. There will come a time, and it might be this year, and it probably will be this year, where, you know, that he's not new anymore and it's going to be okay let's you know let's go let's go you know and so we'll see how we'll see how this year goes but uh i still you 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 put their team up against the rest of the american league central i'm telling you go depth chart by depth chart it's 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 comparable and that's the frustrating thing that they didn't add to it exactly and i'm not going to give them any back rubs for i'm sorry winning effectively by default or backdoor in because they're in the worst division by like you said a mile one thing that really bothered me, and I, I think has a good chance to age quite poorly, is the draft last year. As it unfolded, my tweets are out there. Wyatt Langford. Yeah, he's, Wyatt Langford's going to start for the Rangers on opening day. So. Uh, start? They're saying like hitting the middle of the order. Ben, can you pull up the Wyatt Langford little mashup here of him just crushing the ball and then Ken Rosenthal discussing him? This is the, the buzz lately on that guy, Wyatt Langford, for the Rangers. It looks like he's smiling at the pitcher. Like, I can't wait for you to throw a pitch right now. <laughs> well, there's a drive to the right center. That could be the grand slam. He towers out of here. Sold out crowd watching the youngster clear the bases with his fifth Cactus League home run. This kid is ready. The Rangers are convinced he's ready. And not only is he ready, He is going to hit most likely somewhere in the middle of the order for the defending World Series champions. 
Yeah, not pretty. Now, that ball would not have been out of Comerica Park, though. Okay, what about the other four in spring? Just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, how, how's that? I, I'm not a draft expert. I'm not going to defend it because, uh, again, I prefer college guys because especially when your team looks like they're close and especially when you have a college guy and a high school guy who are both well-regarded and the college guy could be here tomorrow. Like, I, I, I'm not going to defend that. So you, you would have gone with Langford? I would have. I would have. Um, interestingly, talking to some of the draft experts out there, they disagree. Like Kylie McDaniel, you know, he was on the record a couple of weeks ago from ESPN talking about how he liked Clark over Langford. So, I mean, there's still people out there that like Clark. I just, high schoolers, first of all, I don't think high schoolers project as accurately as college players. Um, and again, there's the, the path of how long it's going to take. So, yeah, I mean, you look at that. And even before that, yeah, you like the idea of him being in your lineup now. I mean, they could use him right now. He's good enough to hit in the middle of the Rangers order, the defending champs. Yeah, defending world champs. I mean, with a great but, offense. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I, you're not going to get me to defend that. I think I, they got I some could. value. I think they got some value lower in the draft, but, no, but okay. I mean, you know, this guy's getting Mike Trout comparisons. Uh, you're not going to get me to argue with you on this. I'm, I, mean, I don't disagree. I, I, I mean, come on. And it's not a negative anti Max Clark thing. I, by all kinds, I mean, yeah, like Keith Law, who I respect a lot. He's what I think six spots below Langford on his, you know, his prospect rankings. I think it's they're like six and twelve or something. So it, it's not. So there's, I mean, there's high regard for Max. A hundred percent question. But that guy's gonna hit me. That's just been, that's really a preference of mine. Like if you have to choose of two guys who project pretty well similarly, yeah. I'm gonna go with the college guy. At least I've come to that's been I've come around to that because a college guy can be there faster. And again, they project more accurately because they've faced better competition already um, in college. So I just think that there's less risk there. And and Max Clark wasn't like this. Oh, he is the guy. Like, I mean, you know, like there have been high school guys who have been like, you got to take this guy. I mean, it's no question. He wasn't that. So, and, but, and you know, true. I agree. There were some people I respect that said there's years he'd be the first overall pick. You know, so there's, he's a legit guy. It's not but like in a this draft. Anti- I mean, in this draft, there were about three or four guys where people said any one of them. It's a really good draft. Yeah, I mean, so, um, but I would, yeah, I would have gone with him. Now I'd definitely go with it. But even before, I think I would have gone with it. No brainer. The guy's OPS everywhere he goes is like thirteen hundred. I mean, they can't get him out. Yeah, I, I just, I think that's going to be bad. And it's you know, even if Max Clark ends up being really good, what are the chances he's as good as this guy? I think small. Not. Tiny, tiny, but pretty small. Okay. Well, even it's like, you know, you look at Spencer Torkelson out of college 1-1. I mean, even the the length of development there, you know. And so when you're talking about a high school kid, to me, it just, you know, if I'm a a GM, it just scares me a little bit more with a high school kid. And Max could be great. Um, But, you know, and Riley Green was taken out of high school, and I think he's going to have a good career. But um, it's more volatile as an asset projection. For sure. For sure. A hundred percent. I mean, that's an objective fact. and. And then, and then you know, you draft him, and you don't have to talk about maybe JD Martinez or whatever. You might have your guy. No, there's something to be said for like three years earlier. I'm yeah. sorry that there's something to be said for it, especially when we're this deep in the, this long stretch of mediocrity. You mentioned Torkelson, perfect segue. My argument is, I understand where fans were enthused and wanted to yell at people like me that were saying, "Oh, the numbers looking pretty ugly for a first baseman one one." 758 OPS this year or this past year. You pointed out during the break, what, 815 OPS in the second half? 816. Okay, yeah, I don't want to cheat him out of that. Uh, To me, I don't think we're at a point where he's arrived, we're good, the skeptics have been debunked. Of course not. But that's what people are acting that way. When I had Evan Petzold on, he was in here, he's saying he's not so hot on Torkelson. He's actually concerned that he's ever going to come anywhere close to the ceiling. That was a few months ago. Maybe he's amended his opinion. Where are you at with him? Do you, are you pleased with where he's at? Do you think he approaches that 900 OPS range that you expect him to be at, given his draft status and his position? No, I think I, I'm. I'm certainly not. You know, lighting the world on fire that Spencer Torkelson is going to be, you know, no doubt, unbelievable player for the Tigers for years to come. But you know, I mean, you can laugh at the 816 OPS. It was a good second half. It was progress, and that's what. I, and I think the last time I was on the show might have been with Evan. I'm not sure, but. I think that when you asked us then, or one of the shows, they all run together when you've been here seven yeah, times. Yeah, you had the record, man. 
But one of those times where you asked us, and I think Evan was more negative than I was because my opinion was I wanted to see progress. And we saw progress in 2023. There's no question. You can't deny that. We were talking again when the audio cut out, you know, that, you know, and this has been my point forever. I'm not as willing to just write guys off, like, if they don't come into the major leagues and, and light the world on fire right away. Like, a lot of people are. Like, they want it right away. They want Mike Trout. They want what, what everyone expects Wyatt Langford to do. They want that. But, you know, they want Justin Verlander who comes right in the major leagues and is, you know, rookie of the year and eventually quickly Cy Young. And they want that. It just doesn't happen all the time. And, and the example I always bring up, again, we'll talk J.D. Martinez, who should be a Tiger and is not. But in his first three years at Houston, had an OPS in the 680s. All right. And then comes to Detroit, figures things out, boom, 900, boom, 1,000, you know, and figures it out. Some guys take longer. Um, I just think that we've seen a little bit from Spencer in the second half of last year that, okay, you needed to see that. You know, he's not getting sent down to the minors, you know. He's being more aggressive. He's lifting the ball in the air more. Um, it, was a, it, was a, it was a very good second half. And so I'm, I'm not sold that he's going to be here for 15 years and, you know, be, you know, Norm Cash or whatever. But um, I don't know if you know who that is. But <laughs> Storm and Norm Cash. But, how, how dare you? Um, I guess if I don't know my baseball. But, Have you ever heard of Hank Greenberg? Right, right. Um, but... Um, you know, I, I wanted to see progress. I think we saw significant progress, and that's going to have to continue. I'm insulted by the Norm Cash thing. Yeah. I'm gonna, I need 10 minutes. Can we take another? Can we have another audio break, uh, Ben? <laughs> Look. I bet most of your audience doesn't know much about Norm Cash. Yeah, I fair like, enough. No. I, I like I like Spencer Torkelson. It's not an anti-Torkelson thing. I just I pointed out the objective fact that there's some the already. the standards are high when you draft a first baseman 1-1, one, one, obviously. They should be because it's only happened three times. Absolutely. It's a, the standards have to be high, and you and you have to accept that and understand that. Um, the other two were high schoolers, he's by the going, way. He's going this way, though. I mean, he's going up. I mean, that we saw that. And it was a noticeable spike in the second half. He's you can the la- only. You can laugh at the 8-16. That's obviously not the end game, but yeah. that's a significant improvement. 100%. I'm optimistic. What's his OPS this year? I think it's got to be close to 900. Oh. And I think it will be. Really? Mm-hmm. You, you, you think we're going like 880 plus range? I think so. Yeah, I saw progress. No wonder why you got well, wait. in 87 hey, games he went from He went from 700, 7 whatever in the first half to 8 something in the second half. All right. You know, you, you learn the league a little bit more. You learn how to be a major leaguer. You learn the pitchers. I mean, some guys just take a little bit longer. I think it'll be there. If, if and I'm there, also, by the way, not afraid to be wrong. So well, we can talk about this next spring, and if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Fangraphs doesn't like your your projection. Fangraphs is not right all the time. Well, they didn't say they're right all the time, but I'm just saying that you're a little more optimistic than the analytical models on Torkelson. But you know, Moneyball was a thing for a reason. The movie resonated. And the A's for a won all those World Series. It's, oh, I guess it's his fault. I would Tigers have the same handicap and do their own vending machine trade pretty soon. I mean, it's a joke how this team is being run in terms of the payroll. Tigers well, didn't win a World Series, but I, which team would you have rather watch? Those Tiger teams are so much fun. And I think that that's where the frustration is with this fan base is how much fun that era of Tiger baseball was. I mean, every night was an event. 81 nights a year in downtown Detroit was an event. And I think that's where the frustration is. They're never going to get back to, we're going to buy everybody. And we're going to get every big name that we want. And basically fantasy baseball for Michael. They're never going to get back to that. But to not even like, you know... To not even like come anywhere near, hey, that's a good player. Maybe we need a third baseman. Let's go get him. He's not that expensive, but to not do that is just I, that's for the frustration. It's disappointing. My, I did have issues because the, with the A's with the whole Moneyball thing. I mean, which team would 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 you have been more of a fan of the Tigers from two thousand six to thirteen or the that A's Moneyball team? Tigers, I mean, 100%. of course, it's fun. It was so much fun, and so. That's where the disappointment is that, that, you know, not that they're not spending $200 million, but that they're not even spending $100 million. I was mad that they didn't add a bullpen arm. Uh, 2006, the bullpen was elite. I think they're best or second best year. I think they're number one. Every other year in that run, even when they were good, they were bottom half of the league, uh, just in terms of ERA. They had a bad bullpen every year, even when they had. A but they actually did one. They actually did go out and sign guys, though. But there were a couple opportunities. My big one was Papelbon. You know I was mad about Andrew Miller a different year. That was the year we ended up playing him against him in Baltimore. My point is there were a couple times where I thought Papelbon's there. He was on the market. Didn't get him. Miller, 
there on the market didn't get them. There were a couple opportunities. And that was and that was the fault. And I wrote a big piece about the bullpen blues over that period of time and how it happened. Uh, it was almost like a thesis, and I don't even think I came up with a reason why it happened. Just you know, just happened. But that was the one fault with the Dombrowski Illich blank check. The blank check was to win, but it was also to put to to sell three million tickets every year and to create this huge buzz and to get every star. And who are the stars in baseball? Bullpen arms or not, even Papelbon couldn't hold a candle to signing Prince Fielder as far as the stars, right? Yep. And so that was the fault with Dombrowski and Illich is that they spent all this money, but the bullpen wasn't going to be, we're going to blow the bank on the bullpen because, you know, as I wrote, I think I wrote, and <laughs> he was very pissed that I wrote this, but like no one is spending 50 bucks to watch Todd Jones close out a ball. Yeah, didn't he you call know? you about he, that? He emailed me. <laughs> he the funny thing is, is that he emailed me. <laughs> The funny thing is, is he emailed me like three <laughs> years after the story ran. Like, not just like Googling after, himself. Like, he must have like Googled himself <laughs> and found it. But, but that was my point. And it wasn't a dog dig on him because he, you know, look, he was a oh, significant piece nobody in was, 2016. Nobody was paying to see but, him pitch, though. But that was the thing with Illich and Dabrowski is that if they were going to spend, they were going to spend on the big names. And if, if, you, if you piece together a baseball team, right. even the Papal Bonds of the world, the bullpen's not going to excite. A team. I agree. I and I've never really. Unless you got a guy like Joel Zamaya who just comes out of nowhere and throws 105 miles an hour. As a general matter, there were a couple exceptions I mentioned in Papawana Miller, but I don't really, I don't, I don't have any animosity towards ownership or Dombrowski. My logic is this: you they had did go out and get Alberti, and they did go get Nathan, who but, Nathan never blew a save but, against Detroit, and then was even take those guys, even take the bullpen thing out of it. My argument is they were in the World Series as prohibitive favorites twice and just blew it and had the best team in baseball a third year in 2013. And I think if they win game well, two, Well, the 2013 they win that. was their best team. We've I, talked about this I, yes. before. The 2013 team might have been better than the 84 team. Like, I mean, it was that loaded. Honest to God. Um, so, yeah, they, they blew some opportunities. I'll say that 2006 was a much bigger blown opportunity than the Giants team ended up being pretty good, I think. But 2006 was a big, big fail. Um, and then 2013, I mean, how one pitch changes the entire story of your franchise is just crazy to me. And you know, and again, bullpen. Game three, one pitch, they lost one nothing. One nothing. Like yeah. Napoli hit, Ver- yeah. hit Verlander, so it's, you know. Two pitches. two pitches, two How about games. Two pitches, right? Uh, it's just it's and, crazy. And it's crazy because I mean, I'll say I'll, I'll, to the day I die, I'll say that if, if Poppy doesn't hit that home run, the Tigers win the World Series. I agree, hundred percent. I, Leland disagrees. He said that the Napoli home run was the one that did it, and maybe he's right because if they take a two one lead, but the pop, the David Ortiz one, if you come out of Boston up two nothing, I mean, you've done everything. I mean, you're going to win that series. Hundred percent agree. And, people, and that team was so good. People forget how. It's, it wasn't like not all comebacks are created equal. It wasn't just a four run lead erased in the eighth and then later completely in the ninth with a fifth run. It was in the context of they weren't even touching anybody on the Tigers pitching staff for either of the first two games. I mean, the they had game, no really. hitters. And even the third game. They had no, that's true. Yeah. They had one nothing. Yeah. Like but, they had no hitters into the fifth or sixth but, in the but first two But I'm saying games. like in the, in the moment, <laughs> like, I mean, because I was there, unfortunately, I was at Fenway, and you're sitting there. It's like the the prospect of them even getting a couple guys on. The Tigers were th- they would go three up, three down every inning. I think they had two base runners in like 17 innings no, before that. That team is so good. It's uh, like what happened, that but, team is so I, but, good. but yeah, I mean, that's I, I will digress on the 2013 Tigers and be depressed. Go go all look, night. go compare. Get a spreadsheet and compare the 2013 team to the 2006 team. And you'll think one finished in last place and one won the World Series. That's how different they are in talent. Yeah. The the, 20, the 2006 team is fascinating with how that team was built. It's really not a very talented team if you look at it. If you look back on it, it's really not that great of a team. Dombrowski master class. Like if was, you look at the assembly, it was like Stol Gien, Stol yeah. Polanco, oh, yeah. Yeah. Kenny Rogers bargain. Yeah. You know, they they took like Marcus Timms was productive for that team. They got him for off Shelton. the scrap heap. I mean, it just, it's just that was it a was master pretty, class yeah. by him. So yeah, I, I I don't like the Dombrowski slander out there. I think he did everything. If my argument is well, Dombrowski's going to the Hall of Fame. I mean well, he's yeah, he's my guy. I mean the dude's won I mean he's won everywhere he's been. And you can argue that all right, he's well, spent well, he's spent wisely. He's got the players to win. 
But if you hire him, you're going to be in the World Series. Right. I mean, that's that's been... Every the, team that he's been the general manager of, other than the Expos, and they might have been in there if they didn't have the strike. And he won executive of the year there, too, yeah. for, for building them up into like a viable team. So even his one place yeah. where it didn't happen, he was executive of the year there. He's the man. So you, you love Torkelson. You think he's going to hit 60 homers this year. That's good to know. Let's go back. Can we uh, rerun that? <laughs> I'll tell you what. I'll say 30, 100, and close, 888. I like 888 for the OPS. I, if he's that... That's great. I mean, we all wanted nine plus, but I mean, come on. At what point are you just being a, an asshole? Like, I mean, if, if he's high, high eights, we're good. Javi Baez. Not 888. Not 888. <laughs> Perhaps about 60% that. of that. Yeah, a little better than half. Look, I didn't want him. You're right on that. I, Chris Castellani sat here with me, and we both said this before this. This is when we were talking about all those shortstops. No one was signed yet. I, I came out strong for Seager. Oh, he would have never signed here. Okay, fine, whatever. I said that guy was the clear best guy. That's a win for me. I'll take it. Chris, I think, preferred Correa, but also like Seager. Neither one of us wanted this guy. So none of this is surprising to me. Maybe the extent of how bad The extent it is. of it has to be surprising. But, I but mean, the, the, depth, the extent, fair. The depths of the this being a ineptitude is a surprise. That's fair. Because what it, we were sold, everyone was sold on Baez in that... He's not going to be this guy that's going to, you know, carry you the entire year. He's going to have two two weeks at a time that make you go crazy as a fan, and then he'll have two weeks at a time where he just puts the team on his back. We have seen none of that. That was sold and seen none of that. I think what it, did he have a did he have the walk off hit in in his first game at, at Comerica? Maybe he might have had the the winning hit, and everyone's like, oh, he's, he yep, wears cool he shoes, and here we go. And ever since then, we've seen none of that. I mean. I don't understand how any pitcher throws him a pitch within a foot and a half of the outer edge of the strike zone of the plate. I mean, they kind of learned last year. They they were still giving into him a little bit in his first year here. They that's why his OPS got even worse. This guy's been bottom three both years he's been here in the major leagues in terms of OPS. He's atrocious. Ben, can you throw up his stats for for this year? I mean, this is. It's spring training, but like, come oh, he's on. he's got six hits now. Yeah, yeah, isn't that impressive? It was none for a while. Four, uh, 40, I, think he, I think he started off one for 23, but six for 47. I, the on base, 140, 310 OPS, 14 strikeouts. Look, I get it. Spring, small sample size. Doesn't matter. Spring doesn't matter, but. I 100% agree, but this, all I have is the data in front of me, and I got two years of the guy being terrible in real games, and this. Yeah. I, I, so, I'm sorry. If he were hitting in spring, let's say he were lighting it up. There, the Dominic Calzone guy in Seattle, so I think like a 1,400 OPS in spring. Now, I'm not saying it'd be, oh, the, here comes the redemption tour, but it'd be a little encouraging to see him not flailing about, right? I mean, just a little bit. Am I, am I not? <sighs> Tell me this. Am I being unfair? There's nothing to be optimistic about with Javi Baez. Am nothing. I being crazy? Cut the check and get him the hell out of here. It's $98 million. It's easier said than done. You're gonna he's a negative. He's, he's an anchor. He's hurting you. I think that this year will be a, a year where they will evaluate. Obviously, look, Scott evaluate. Harris. Scott Harris was. Now, this is where you, you know, you don't know what to make of Scott Harris yet. I get that. Whatever. He was. This is not his fault. No, and, and he no. was very clear in his introductory presser when he was talking with us afterward. Where you know he he did that whole dissertation, which was really fascinating. We're going to win with the strike zone, and you know it's starting with the strike <laughs> zone in and out for pitching. We got to throw strikes for hitters. We got to swing at strikes. You know, and you know, if pitching if we throw strikes, then our defense is going to be on their toes. It's the whole wheel it starts with the strike zone, and then we asked him afterwards. So how does Javi Bias fit into that? And he just kind of smiled and goes. Oh, well, we, we'll we'll he'll adapt, and you know it obviously hasn't happened. Uh, it's been a disaster. That's what he he's got ninety eight million dollars in four years. He's not going to get cut this year. It's not going to happen. Um, but he could be benched this year. I think that they're going to give him a couple months, and if it's that big of a disaster, they're going to have to find another option. They're not going to just cut the check right now. It's ninety eight million dollars. But let's, let's say he runs. Like Chris Illich is not going to do that. He's. Paying him anyway. He's not gonna, but he's not gonna pay him to, to go away. He's not gonna do that. Not ninety eight million dollars. Can we do something? Is there anything they can do to just make him so miserable that he quits? <laughs> Does he have options left? Like a major, he, like in major league, when you give him the terrible plane with the duct tape just, on the wing, and, yeah, make him and fly the lack of towels. Him. But now the Tigers have a new plane, and uh, you know, he, it, you know, I don't even feel bad for the guy. And, and you know, Evan Petzl had a great, you know, back 
sort of you know backstory information there and some inside baseball from talking to Baez, and he seems to think, and he weighed out the reasons why that Baez really cares. All I know is I see a guy on tape telling fans how rich he is and he doesn't give a fuck and, and, and taunting the fans and doing all this bullshit. He's the, he's not even a sympathetic... Like, Jordan Zimmerman is the worst contract in Detroit sports history. This one's pushing it. I, I felt bad for the guy. He wasn't flipping the bird at fans and grabbing his junk and all that shit. This guy's not even a sympathetic... You, Shitty certainly, you certainly want a little bit of humility when you're terrible. I don't want him around. Look, we all know he's not going to go anywhere. So, okay, next it, topic. <laughs> he's just not. Like people ask, what are they going to do with him? They're just not going to cut him for ninety eight million dollars. Okay, just not. When when do you cut him? If he's I don't know. Like five ninety eight OPS this year again. Do you bring him back next year? And then the argument is too. And then Chris and I kind of debated this a little bit too. Well, he's good defensively, and I'm like, is he? Like, I don't know. Makes some nice plays, but he makes some nice plays, and then he but- butchers some easy plays, and it's like, mm, I don't know. Are you really that good defensively? I don't know. Um, that's a tough one to figure out. Like. It's crazy that you're just hoping that you get a guy who has a 290 on base percentage and a 650 OPS. Or, you know, I mean, it's just nuts that what a disaster. And I just, he fell, he fell fast and he fell, fell hard and he fell fast. And I, I don't see any optimism with there, with that. And, uh, and I, and I don't doubt Devin or Evan that he, that he cares. But yeah, when you're struggling, you probably should be a little bit more aware of the image that you're portraying and show a little bit of humility. You know, when you're struggling, no one wants to see that stuff. I want to rip through some positive stuff here really quick. With, with Javi Baez? No, he's oh, terrible. There's oh. nothing nice to say. Okay. He, that we're, I'm done with him. <laughs> Scooble looks awesome. Scooble's going to be an ace. Don't tell him that because he doesn't like the term ace, but... He doesn't like... Why, why not? I don't know. He just didn't, don't labels or something, but uh, he did... Chris Castellani did a really good interview with him. If you haven't seen it, I thought it was really good. Um, He's really good, and he's a big reason why anchoring that rotation that that I think that this team can contend and will contend deep into the past the summer and, and have a chance. Um, he's he's good. Chris is waiting on that victory lap, man, because he he said like like two three years ago, Chris. It was a I mean a while ago. He's like that guy's going to win a Cy Young. He might, and he's point. on the board now. Now he's on the he's board. On what the is board. he like seventh or something favorite or say he's yeah. in there? What is he twenty? He might even be twenty to one or something. Like that. I'm not sure. I exactly. think he's in the top ten odds, whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean he's he's impressive, and I'm Stay really healthy. That's the key. It's a uh, you say that with a lot of these guys, and that's the frustrating thing is that during the Avila era, you know, it seemed like every pitcher got hurt, right? And um, um, talking to people that that it can't be a coincidence. There has to be some something going on with your infrastructure, with medical and health, and that's been a big change um, with the Tigers under Harris. There's been a lot of emphasis in that. With I mean, totally flipping the the medical and the science stuff. So you hope if you're a Tiger fan that the the key injuries to pitchers are behind you. So the Tigers have made tangible changes into. Something with their structure. Yeah, they have. Wise? They've got more. They've got a much more detailed, I think, medical program, like like scientific, like that they deal with. And I think they were dealing. With, they might have even been working with U of M at some point with some like stuff that's way above my knowledge. Like as far, I mean, I wasn't good with science. My mom wanted me to be a doctor, and that was never going to happen because I don't understand this stuff. But I do know that they placed a big emphasis on that. And talking to people in the late in the Avila, Avila era, when people when these pitchers were getting hurt, I heard from a lot of people in the game that it's not a coincidence. It can't be a coincidence. Something's wrong in the way that you are working with these pitchers and the way they are developing that is causing these injuries. Uh, I mean, send that guy down to Tampa to help them out because the Tigers have been a picture of health pitching wise compared to the Rays. I mean, right. The Rays have seven guys under the knife like every two weeks. Yeah, the thing about the Rays is they got twenty more. <laughs> that uh, that's, right, that's why I don't pop ex- right into your. You know. Yeah, it's Chris. Speaking of Chris, Chris is always arguing with me about the Rays, and you know, I'm a big. I'm not a Rays fan. I'm like rooting for them, but I, I respect them, and no, I'm, I mean, I'm blown away at how much they win with all these injuries and all. It's parent. remarkable that they do it with no money, and you know, Chris and, hates them. He thinks they're a joke. They're a bunch of losers. And all I it, my my point is that's the the Rays are the ultimate reason why I don't give a crap about excuses with the Tigers because if the Rays can figure it out and if you're not spending anywhere near league average I don't want to hear about injuries maybe you should have bought up a little more depth you said it with J D and with Riley Green's injuries like it's I don't want to hear it when yeah. you're not spending it's like maybe you should have signed a couple more guys wouldn't well. be such a problem but Scooble's awesome the rotation really in general I like Maeda. 
My, my, that was yeah, a nice move. I, I think Flaherty has big potential for bounce back. Um, and I think Mize is the guy to watch. 98.7 miles an hour I read the other day. Yeah. In, in Mize, spring. to me, is the guy in the rotation this year to watch. He takes a step forward. Scooble is Scooble. And all bets are off. This team can contend, definitely contend. And then... I mean, the reports on Jackson Job from last fall and that he might be here this summer. The rotation is where I, I pin the hopes on if you're a Tiger fan. And that's why I think that, you know, again, that's why it's like, why can't you just go get one of those two pieces? But to to kind of fill it all out, make it all work. But Mize to me, more than even school, because I think we know what to expect from school. If he stays healthy, he's a stud. Mize, I think, could have a big year. The rotation is getting really interesting because we we talked about school. And again, like Manning's in the minors. Like this is a guy who was your number, who could have been your number three or four last year or the year before, and he didn't even make the cut. And, and by well the way, he had a good spring. Pitched well in spring. Yeah, like I mean, and so that's that's the interesting thing about this Tiger team is that you know Bo Brisky gets cut. You know, like he didn't make the team. Might have been an automatic guy a couple of years ago. You're starting to see more of these. No one's you know you know we're not just filling up the roster spots like there's there's people behind that are getting left behind and uh so that's a good sign yeah you, you mentioned that on the podcast with uh, mccoskey today you said something like you know, they're they had the better problem now you're starting to see guys get cut and you're like oh shit yeah they cut him like when i saw manning i'm like okay that's that was like <laughs> right. an eye opener because again i looked and i'm like i thought manning had a really good spring and he did and he didn't even make the cut. Um, when, so. when was the last time there was a spring training cut that we were like, oh, my God, the, he was playing so well. It's, it's, it's no, it, was, it was probably Marcus Timms in 2000 and whatever <laughs> over Bobby Higginson. <laughs> yeah, like, Remember that? Guy. Remember that? Yeah, that was a big that thing. That was a big deal because yeah. they kept Higginson, who was just terrible at that point. Yeah. And that caused a lot of problems in that clubhouse by, by doing that because uh, that was probably the last one to me that stood out, like a big cut, like, whoa. So you're you're at 87 wins. I'm, Does that get him I, in I want to catch that a little bit. I I, I – I think I probably spoke a little too. High. I think that they're going to be over five hundred. I do, think. Do they win the division? I have them in second place behind the Twins. Next year, but I haven't. Huh? I have it being a very close race. When do they win this crap division? It could be this year. I mean, it really could be this year. I, I think you should yeah. expect them to win it within the next two years. There is a lot more to like about watching this team. For all my negativity, they were, there was a lot of fun. Players to watch last year, and yes. you know because they have the young guys. You know, it used to be we were sold on, oh Scott Sizemore is coming up. Oh my, he's going to be the next. You know, now it's like you're sold on these young guys, and they come up and they produce, and yeah. that's a different offensively. Tigers have done that with their pitchers. They've had pitchers come up over the years, but offensively, the history of the franchise isn't really overly great you know uh, at least in recent years recent years it's atrocious yeah did you see my graphic that yeah. we made on twitter a few so months so now you see you see riley green come up and have a torrid month you know you see spencer torkelson have the 30 some homers and a good second half last year you see you know carrie carpenter carrie carpenter wasn't even one of the guys you were thinking of come up and wow he, he could be good you see parker meadows come up and you see what he can do you know you see what he's going to look like defensively so now it's like you see these guys come up and they actually do something that gets you excited um like you know even during that run in like the 2006 to 13 when they had the prospect coming up and it was like it'd come up and it'd be like uh, that's it you know so it, it they're fun um yeah they could be more fun with some more talent you know that infuse some bigger names and again just the short-term commitment that you could have had these guys for, like Mike was talking about. But uh, I think they'll be fun again, and I think they'll contend well into the season. You, you put it way too nicely with the bats. Uh, do you know, the? remember we talked about this, who was the last batter that the team drafted and in Detroit had a top nine AL MVP finish? Um, I, I, I should know this. Um and they didn't win it, but I mean, they no, were. no, no, no. Of course not. Yeah, I mean, we're what talking top nine. This is a, this is top nine. We're talking Darren Erstad, Sean Figgins. I mean, there have been some oh, like Lorenzo Kane. It's not that hard to have one magical year. What it, year was it? The dra- the draft year. The, uh, the year the, that they had in the top. I think nine. it was. I think it was the eighty four team. It was well, give or, It was either eighty three, eighty four. It was right in there. Well, it's got to be. Trammell, then. It's Kirk Gibson. Kirk Gibson. Kirk Gibson. Trammell wasn't in the top 10 that year. Well, no, but he was drafted. He must have been drafted before Gibson. Uh, I'm guessing, because that's... A, so, so you said top nine finish, right? Yeah. So who was the top 10? 
Uh, there must have been a guy who finished tenth that you cut off the list to cherry pick. Of course, yeah, of course. You Why? Did. Otherwise, it would have been ten. I it was say, either. I think it was either Alex Anderson, Avila. Was Gra- I think did Avila, Alex Avila. He was close. I think Avila was like twelfth. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, I think it was year. Granderson. But I knew when you had the top nine, I'm like, there must have been a top of ten. Of course, <laughs> yeah, of course. But that's that's still atrocious, though. I mean, you know, single digit, you could oh, justify it's it. Bad. That. It's bad. That's almost impossible. So I, I I like what a lot of this team is doing. I just don't think the spend is there. And I think a lot of our optimism being based on, oh, they're in a shitty division, while true, isn't necessarily an exciting thing that gets my you know, jollies going. No, I get it. It's I just, it. that's But not I still awesome. think they're going to be entertaining. I agree. I, I'm excited for the baseball season. I'm a big baseball fan, obviously, too. It's, it's probably my number one sport, honestly, in terms of passion. It's pretty crazy that it's already here. I, I thank God, though, yeah. especially with Michigan State basketball. I, here's <laughs> a, speaking of college basketball. Michigan State basketball was preseason number four. Not thrilled with uh, their season. Oh, I know their well. coach isn't. Nobody is. I think the happiest uh, bunch of fans in town and in the state of Michigan, the OU fans, you were right in the thick of this. Tell me about that. What was that like covering it? That was cool. Um, it was cool because I um, I was around it from the beginning of the season. And I've been around the team. You know, They have a very veteran team, and I've been around them because I've done – Oakland games for, you know, alongside Neil on the TV side for the last couple of years, the home games. So being around him was was cool. But then, you know, like knowing going into the season that this could very well happen. I'm not saying the Kentucky win, but that they could get back to the NCAA tournament and then seeing what they did. It was it was fun to, to be around it, you know, just and not just because they beat Kentucky and, you know, should have be really could have beat North Carolina State. But um Getting to know the the kids on that team, I mean, it's one of the n- nicest group of athletes I've ever been around. Most polite, most humble. Um, so it was a lot of fun. Going into that Kentucky game, I mean, you were covering that this whole process, right? Did you see anything with them that you said, oh, these guys might pull this off, or at least they think they can? Yeah, I said if they if they made between, I think I said if they make between fifteen and twenty threes, they got a chance. I think they made fifteen. DQ Cole hit the big one um, that uh, Jack Olkey obviously hit 10 of them. But um, I said if they could do that, because talking to Campy, I think it was Monday or Tuesday. I think it was Monday, because Selection Sunday, you know, and he was all excited because, you know, big name, and it was obviously going to be big exposure for, for Oakland. But then I sat down with him Monday after practice, and I asked him, I said, oh, you've seen some film now. What do you think? And he looked at me, and he just kind of shook his head. And I'm like, well, what, you don't, you know, it's a tough matchup? He goes, no, we can win. He goes, we can beat this team. He goes, if it would have been Creighton or if it would have been Iowa State or, you know, I wouldn't be saying that, but we can beat this team. We got to we got to make it a shit ton of threes, and we got to limit them offensively. He said 74, but they ended up keeping them in 76, which is pretty good for the number two scoring offense in the country. Um, he expected that Trey Town – he actually wasn't counting on Trey to have a big game because – you know, Kentucky's got those three seven footers um, that you just don't see in the Horizon League. So he said, if we make fifteen between fifteen and twenty threes, we got a shot. And they made fifteen, and Trey Townsend just didn't care about the seven footers in the second half and kind of took over. So I thought they had a chance. Uh, I mean, I picked them to lose like everybody else, but uh, I, I thought they had a chance. Plus, you know, Kentucky has a history of, you know, not exactly showing up in the, you know, with all these freshmen and performing well in the early rounds of the NCAA tournament. They were a trending national title pick, though. They were they were up there in sort of that second tier of popular picks. They probably were up there in, what, two years ago when they lost to St. Peter's, too. Yeah, they were. They were. Yeah, and that was, you know, they had the national player of the year, uh, Sheepway. The other thing someone told me going in is that Oakland obviously didn't have any NCAA tournament experience other than Rocket Watts, the one play-in game against UCLA with Michigan State. But they had four seniors. And they won a shit ton of close games this year. And so someone was telling me, he's like, you know, they got a lot of seniors. They know, and they've, you know, that that comes in handy when things, when the lights get bright and things get tight. And Kentucky's got a lot of freshmen. And we've seen this over the years in a lot of NCAA tournaments that the, you know, the freshmen tend to wilt more than the seniors tend to, you know, the seniors tend to rise. And I think that played a major impact as well. I mean, look at the, the Reed Shepard kid was afraid to shoot. I mean, if you watch that game, I mean, he he wasn't going to shoot if he, unless he had a wide open shot. I mean, you got Jack Golke who was just darting around making ten threes. This kid from Division Two a year ago, 
Reed Shepard, this kid everyone talks about, he was under the bright lights. You watch that game back. He was afraid to shoot the ball. He's terrified. I mean, he was absolutely afraid. Didn't score until there was, what, three or four minutes left in he the game. He looked like he didn't even want him to pass it to him. I no, mean, he like, was Dillingham terrified. played a little bit better, but between the two of them, I mean, Golke outscored him by a mile. You know, I mean, and um, so someone told me that watch out for that. You know, the seniors over the freshmen could matter, and it did. You've known what, an, what a vibe. I mean, just to see that building, awesome. which was eighty percent Kentucky fans. I mean, they were Kentucky fans were still piling into the building twenty minutes after the game started. I mean, and just to see it was like it was kind of like the scene out of Rocky Four where Rocky's fighting in Moscow, you know, and it's all against him, and then to see it shift at the you know with all at the end, you know, with all those other fans, and it was cool to watch. You've known Greg Campy a long time. What do you think that game meant to him? Oh, it meant everything. He has told me before, and I called him out on this. I think it's bullshit. But he's told me before that a win over Michigan State would mean more than a win in the NCAA tournament. And I called him out on that. I'm like, that's bullshit. Yeah, I don't believe that. Obviously, though, he wants to beat Michigan State. You know, he's 0 for whatever, a million. Um, he's played some close games. The K Felder ball at the Palace when Michigan State was number one, and K Felder had the ball that rolled around the rim and around the rim and around the rim and didn't go in, and they lost in overtime. Um, that obviously would have meant a lot because that was on national television against number one Michigan State. Um, but, you know, they beat Kentucky, and, you know, Here's your first your program's first ever win in the round of 64. They had a play-in win back in 2015 or 20, 2005, their first ever Division One. I think they beat Alabama A and M, whatever. But to win a game, and even like, all right, say you draw Creighton and you beat Creighton, it doesn't land like beating Kentucky. And even John if Creighton's Cal- better, I know, and they are. But it doesn't land like being beating John Calipari and Kentucky and those freshmen, those draft picks on national television in prime time, like the game of the day, drew 6 million viewers, it doesn't land like that. So he acknowledged after the game that that, that one was the biggest in his career. Because he had said before, he's like, if we win this game, then yes, it'll be the biggest win in program history. But for me, maybe not. Because he still counts that Michigan win in 2000, you know, because Mich- Oakland had just gone Division One, and that was a big win in Campy's dad and brother both played football at Michigan, so he had some bragging rights. So he still considered that one. And if he had beaten Michigan State, like the K Felder game, if they had won that, that would have been up there. But after the game, I mean, he was immediately just, you know, he knew that was the biggest win of his career and probably will be the biggest win of his career. Were you in the locker room after? I believe you were, right? I was around. I, I don't think I stepped foot in the locker. I was outside the locker. I was all over the place. What, what was the, the vibe like there? Was, were they hooting and hollering back there, skipping around? What was that like? They were very excited, obviously, but not not as much as maybe you'd expect. Like, I got the vibe from this team that they felt all week that they were going to win that game. They, I mean, they're a very confident group. I mean... Before the Horizon League tournament final against Milwaukee, Greg Campy went up to Jack Golke, and he said, Campy said, just one more, just one more. And Golke looks at him, he goes, just seven more, just seven more. And it's funny, except I don't think they were joking. Like, And I remember also with Golke, who's just fascinating, and I'm very happy for everything that's come his way, because, uh, you know, coming from Division Two and, to, you know, just a great story, but... Um, Mon- that Monday at practice after selection Sunday at the arena, um, Golke's shooting threes, and I, th- I took a video. He made like a shit ton in a row. And so then he comes over, and I'm just standing there, and he asked me, he's like, Tony, what do you think of Kentucky? I'm like, man. I said, man, they got two lottery picks two, two lottery picks coming off the bench. And he looks at me, he goes, that means there's going to be three lottery picks off the bench for the game, <laughs> talking about himself. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> But he said he was sending a point where uh, sending and he was, you know, he was sending a statement that we don't care who they are. You know, we, we have a chance to win this game. They, they believed that all week and you saw it. They never I mean, Kentucky's biggest lead for the game was two. I mean, I mean, Oakland dominated, you know, that game. I mean, really, in a lot of aspects uh, against a team that should have been better. They were bigger. They're faster. You know, they're more acclaimed. Um, but it was funny because after they won the Horizon League title, Golke was actually pissed that they were cutting down the nets. And he was pissed that they were taking the photo with that big ticket, you know, punch your ticket thing. Because he's like, guys, we, we, have, we have more work to, that we're going to do. Like, he believed that. And the whole team did. So um, it wasn't as exciting as you would have thought. I mean, they were pumped, no question. 
But you got the sense early in the week that they were they meant business. I wanted that second win for them so badly. And they they could had a wide could, open three in the corner could, to go up four. Lantman, yeah. Uh, they could have had it. And then they, 37% three-point shooter. To not, senior. To, Lantman, had, Lantman didn't have a good tournament, and, I, and that's a bummer because he got him. I mean, he's a big reason why they got there. Um, but uh, to not get the shot off, you know, with the tie game with 15, 16, 17 seconds left, that's going to haunt Campy. I mean, he's he's still distraught that they didn't even get a shot off um, to have a chance to win that game. And, uh, you know, you go to overtime, and, you know, that's where Cinderella is a lot of times. You know, And they, of course, hated the term Cinderella. But, you know, journalists, we love it, you know, because that's what it, you know, we love cliches. Uh, Cinderella's tend to, overtime, they tend to, that's a bad place for them. And uh, that was a game they could have and should have won. And, uh, and after that, who knows? I mean... I mean, you make the Sweet 16, and all of a sudden, they're a legitimately good team. They're very good. I, I mean, they're a very good team, and, but, but because they're from the Horizon League, no one really knew anything about them. No one knew anything about Jack Goki. No one knew anything about Trey Townsend. They're gonna, they found out, especially about Trey Townsend. They found out a lot about him. So. Well, let's talk about Trey Townsend, actually. I'm making the pitch. This is my campaign. You've seen it, for those that haven't been. You mentioned Cinderella. Let's talk about other fictional characters in the land of Oz. Trey Townsend. Let's get him these Lansing. Ben, roll that, please, for us. There he is. I want Trey Townsend here. I was blown away by this kid's game. You look at his numbers against Power 5, four opponents this past year, over 20 points a game, really effective, put 17 up against my school, Michigan State, our school, Michigan State. Obviously, we saw what happened in the NCAA tournament. It was like 25 and a half points a game and 12 and a half rebounds in his two games. Dominant in that Milwaukee game for the conference championship, 38, 11, and 5. I want this kid here. I need this kid here. What do you make of my stance? Should Michigan State want Trey Townsend on their team? Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I started to get the sense pretty early in this season that, you know, that he wasn't coming back. I think, you know, I, I would say, you know, things on the television broadcast, like, you know, oh, Oakland fans should appreciate what they have this year because, you know, while they have them. And they didn't understand. They're like, oh, you know, he's got one more year of eligibility left. Yeah, he does. And it's not going to be at Oakland, in all likelihood. I mean, unless Oakland finds the bag because uh, he's going to get paid and well into the six figures. And I think that Michigan State makes a lot of sense. Tom Izzo talks about, He's going to make some changes. He's going to try to, you know, mix things up because he's going to go deeper in this tournament or die trying. Um, so uh, Trey Townsend would be a guy that um, if, if and when Trey Townsend goes in the portal, Tom is, would probably be among the first phone calls. He's not a huge dude. He's 6'6". Six, six. He's not some seven-footer. He's not Zach Eady. But he plays bigger than his 6'6". Six, six. And you saw it against Kentucky, the seven-footers. He went in there, took over the second half. When they needed him and got the job done against them, he did it again against NC State against those big dudes. That God, that Burns guy. By the way, uh, I never saw the DJ Burns kid. What a game he has! I mean, just what a fun player to watch. This big guy that looks like Zach Randolph, who <laughs> who could move like a ballet dancer and fire passes like he was a shortstop. I mean, just very impressive game. But but Trey was the undersized guy in both those games and and took over at times. Um, he plays bigger than his 6'6", and he's just tough. I mean, he's just a tough kid. Uh, he's a good passer. He doesn't have to be the guy if, if it's not happening for him. Like the one of the, I think the Horizon League semifinals, it wasn't happening for him. They were doubling him. He saw double teams all year long, except in the NCAA tournament where the opponents thought they didn't have to double him because they were bigger, and then he burned them. Uh, but he saw doubles all year long, and he, I mean, he has a ton of assists. I mean, he's really good at finding the open man. He doesn't have to be the guy. Uh, so he's a good clubhouse guy, as they say. So I think he fits with Michigan State, and I think it'd be a great story for him to end up there. You covered the guy. You know, obviously anyone can see that watches him. Hell of a player. Tom Izzo talks about our kind of guy. You know, OKG and a certain type of prototype, not just in style of play, but personality and selflessness. What's Trey Townsend like as a dude? Do you think you know, he fits in the room? You know, I mean, he's. I mean, I've known him for a few years now, 
and really got to know him. I did a big story on him last year, um, last season, because um, it was very clear that he was becoming the guy in the Horizon League. Antoine Davis was about to leave. I remember telling Trey, I'm like, you're going to be the Horizon League Player of the Year the first year that Antoine leaves. And that's what ended up happening. And by the way, he was the Horizon League Player of the Year, even though he only averaged 17, only 17.3 points, which was like seventh in the league. But that's how much the the coaches knew how good he was and knew what he meant to the team. He didn't have to be the guy every night. Again, if he was getting doubled, you know, he was going to, you know, he had Blake Lampman and Jack Golke. And um, so I got, but I got to know him pretty good last season, did a story on him talking about his upbringing. I mean, this is a kid who, you know, he first met Campy when he was two years old because, uh, you know, both of Trey's parents, Skip and Nicole, both went to Oakland. Uh, Skip played for Campy back in the Division two days. And so, Trey started going to the Oakland camps when he was eight years old, and all he ever wanted to do was play basketball at Oakland. I mean, who who says that? You know, like that just doesn't happen. That you got this kid who's going to be pretty good, and all he wants is Oakland. And uh, and uh, you know, he just he Campy calls him Mister Oakland. They've had some really good players over the years. They've had guys in the NBA. They've had other guys who led him to the NCAA tournament. But he calls Trey Towns and Mister Oakland, even though Greg knows, expects, and almost hopes that he leaves, you know, to better his future after this season. But as far as a team guy, I mean, they had a lot of those guys, but, I mean, he's he's A number one. I mean, the, those guys on that team respect the hell out of him, and, uh, and not just for what he meant on the floor, but just a good dude. I mean, you won't find anybody say anything bad about Trey Townsend. I and, if talking- and if someone did say anything bad about Trey Townsend, I would question the person that said it. Over Trey Townsend. I yeah, I mean, I haven't heard a bad word about the guy. I, he's he's my cause celeb right now. There's going to be a number of great guys in the portal we don't even know about yet. I just I love his game. I love his personality, his style of play. I'm fine with him. And the fact undersized. that he can play bigger. And by the way, he can shoot threes, as we saw against North Carolina State. Because that's funny because no one saw him shoot threes this year. He only took ten the whole season. Because you have Blake Lamb and you have Jack Golke, and then you have DQ Colt. You don't need Trey Town. You need Trey to go inside, do his thing with Chris Conway, uh, and just you know handle it in there. But Trey was so pissed off in that first half <laughs> against North Carolina State because it was a physical game, a very physical game on both sides, and the refs just said, "Fuck it," <laughs> you know, let him go, and they did. And Trey was getting frustrated, and so he finally just said, "Screw it, I'm going to take a couple threes and just drains both of them." So he's got that part of his game too, if need be. Uh, but he just plays bigger than he is, and that you know, personality-wise and on the floor. I mean, he's just—I'm—I'm I'm getting to know him over the last few years. Seeing this happen to him is, uh, you know, is—I'm happy that this is happening for him because you know, I kind of you know didn't see this coming necessarily, but you knew it was a special player a couple of years ago, and to see what he was able to do um, and put himself on the map in just a really a three-game span. I mean, Milwaukee, you know, I mean, he was always going to transfer and he was always going to get paid in the, in all likelihood. Look, there's still a chance he could come back. But for the, in all likelihood, he, he's graduating this spring and he's going to do that one-year at the Powers Conference. Um, and uh, he was always going to get paid and always going to go there. But now, after the game against Milwaukee, where he just, it was one on five. I mean, and he just beat them. Um, against a very good Milwaukee offense, you know, like they ended up beating him because Trey Towns had just decided I'm going to score 38 and could have scored 40. Um, and then you got the two primetime games um, in the NCAA tournament where they saw him going up against bigger dudes and uh, and and not just holding his own, but thriving. So, yeah, Michigan State seen that Tillman used to lock up Luka Garza, you know, four inches taller than him or three inches taller and, and quite a bit heavier at the time. It's, it's there's a prototype there. That kid can play. I want him like Holloman against Ed. <laughs> yeah, 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 a little bit of a bigger disparity there. But I, and you know who I'm talking about. I don't want to out him on the air. I, I I don't even think he'd care. But just in case he would. But I was talking to a Lansing media member, dignitary who knows Tom Izzo very well. You know who I'm talking about. And he said, Ah, I, he saw my thing about Townsend. He goes, I don't know. I don't think Tom would do that to. To Greg Campy, mm. they're friends. He's not going to take his guy. What's your take on that? Do you yeah, think that's that, that's, an, that's it's not an impediment? It's not. No, it's not at all. Um, you know, look, Greg. Greg and I talked about an hour after the North Carolina State game. I didn't want to ask him about it at the press conference because you know, you know, I'm sure he didn't want to discuss the future. You know, that quickly after the loss. So in the hallway, about an hour after we we chatted, and I just started talking to him about Trey, and I'm like, you know, look, 
I said, for people, for fans that don't understand why Trey might leave, what would you say to them? And he just said, he's going to get paid, and not just paid, like substantially. I mean, the projections out there are crazy. I mean, uh, there's a lot of money out there to be had. He put himself on the map out this, you know, this season as a whole, but obviously in prime time in the NCAA tournament. And Greg said, you know, to me, he's like, he gave me four years. That's all I asked for. He gave me four years. He's going to graduate, which means Campy's rule is you have to graduate to get your number in the rafters. So he's going to get that. And uh, Campy's like, how can I ask any more of them? And he, Campy understands the situation. Now, look, Oakland, you know, they've got a few more alums who are a little bit more alert and awake about their program. <laughs> after that. <laughs> after that. Um, you know, I think that they have a little bit more dialogue going on about what can we do. And so Campy is, you know, I wouldn't even say cautiously optimistic. I mean, they're looking for money, obviously, to see what, but you're talking the difference between tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars. And Campy will hold no grudge and, uh, and told me that, you know, you know, that, He's going to get a lot of calls when he goes in the portal, and he'd be surprised if a guy in East Lansing didn't do it. And Campy would have no issue with that. Okay, so none, no issue with. Did none. he meant? Did he say Michigan State when you talked? To I him? said Michigan State, and, and he didn't. He would have no issue with that. I'm confident. Do you think saying. Tom Izzo would? I don't think so because they're friends. They're going to they're going to talk it over. I'm sure. I bet you the first call Izzo would make would be to Campy, and then it would be to Trey. Yeah, you know, just to you know, but. This is the reality of college basketball. He gave you four years. Campy said, has said that all year long, that he gave us everything we asked for. He's Mr. Oakland. That's what he calls him. Camp, I mean, obviously Campy is Mr. Oakland, but Campy wants to call Trey Townsend Mr. Oakland just because of his upbringing where at two, three, four years old, all he wanted to do was go to Oakland, and he went there, and he, took, he led him to the greatest season in Oakland basketball history with the biggest win in Oakland basketball history, and he's got a chance to get paid in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Campy knows the reality of the situation, and he's happy to watch him go thrive on the next level. And if it, if he thrived at Michigan State next year, Campy would be thrilled. Can you help me uh, facilitate some type of NIL deal? No. If he comes to Michigan State, <laughs> can we organize that? What can I do as the Spiro Avenue Show guy to get my? I want him in East Lansing, Tony. I like that guy's game. Well, there's going to be money. I mean, it's all about money. I mean, he's going to get offers. I mean, we're talking. I mean, we I've, I've heard people talking up. half a million dollars. I mean, that's and I'm fine. I haven't heard that from one person. I've heard that from many people uh, across the game. So uh, it's all about money, you know. Yeah, we can. We got it. I, but I was story. Told- I mean, it would be a great story. I mean, to go from Oakland. But by the way, Oakland and MSU had such a connection for for a long time. I mean, the universities, you know, to go. Be on the biggest stage with Oakland and lead them to the biggest win, and then go to MSU and kind of change the culture a little bit there in how Tom Izzo does things and maybe lead them to something special. It would be a phenomenal story. I think he's taking them to the Final Four. They got to make that call. That guy's that guy's a baller, man. He is not afraid. I just I, I, getting to know him. I'm just I'm just happy that that people learned about him and learned who he is and learned what kind of player he can be. Yeah, great story. And the parents were cool. I want to finish here. Last thing. Totally off topic, although I guess it is still in the college basketball realm. You were one of the first people, I think you're probably the first guy, that was saying, hey, keep an eye on that Drew Valentine guy. You know, just We all knew him from the grad assistant, obviously his brother, star national player there at Michigan State. But you said, you know, we're not there yet with the Izzo succession, but when we get there, keep an eye on him. That was like probably what, three years ago you told me that, maybe longer. Now, stock up. He had a really good first year backslid really good third year what's your take on him ultimately as the Izzo successor which I think we're still a few years away so probably a ways away I agree but But do you you still are you still on that train where where you at I think he's trending in that direction and obviously has the ties there and I think that you know it could make a lot of sense um but I just think it's so far away like I like when would like when would we think realistically Izzo would walk away like Six years, ten years, like I mean, it's that probably be between. Tough. It's probably between that number. I mean, it's still a long ways away. I mean, there was a time where Tom Crean was the natural successor. I mean, so it's it's just too early to tell. But he's certainly trending in that way. Yeah, I like him a lot. I I'm not trying to push his a lot. I I've been the one arguing with these people, and I guess we'll finish on this point. I think it's crazy, Tony, and and I know you've had some qualms with this, though. I believe. I, I think have, it's. Cra- I have no issue with this, though. But uh, am I making something up? I thought we disagreed on the last time you were here. We talked about it. Uh, whatever. It doesn't matter. The point is people are trying to push him out 
in some circles of the Michigan State fan base, even people that really like Tom Izzo, right, are saying, "Love him, build the statue, we'll honor him, we'll throw him a parade." It's time, time he's go. done. Yeah. Are you in this? Tom Izzo is cooked. Please, God, retire. No, I'm not there. But I mean, this is a different world of college athletics, and you you adapt or you're done. Like, I mean, I think that, and some guys couldn't handle it. I mean, look at who walked away, who couldn't handle the job. I mean, Coach, you know, Krzyzewski walks away. Roy Williams walks away. Jay Wright, how old is he? I mean, he walks away because he's he didn't want to deal with it. Bayheim leaves. Now, I think Bayheim was probably pushed out. I don't think he walked away on his own. But um, look at the guys. I mean, even football, Saban, you know. If it's the old college football, Saban's not leaving. Like, it's just a different time, and you have to adapt, and you have to embrace the NIL. You have to embrace the portal. Um you know, look. Who's texting you over there? Tell them to shut up. It's, it's Twitter. People probably tell me how terrible this show is. Oh. <laughs> how, how terrible my opinions are. <laughs> They're just blowing um, you up over there. But, well, um, you better be breaking a story for these levels. No, level um, but you have to adapt. I mean, and I don't think he, and I think it's fair, and I think he's acknowledged that he hasn't adapted as well as he should. Um, look, he wanted, you know, he, he prides himself in the culture of Michigan State, which is totally fair. And that's what I miss most about college athletics with all this is that nobody builds that program anymore, right? That used to be what you did is you build a program and the programs that built a program from the ground up, I mean, and had the staying power. It was such a cool thing. And Michigan State did that. It's not the way it is anymore. The players have power, which I think that, you know, they should have a fair amount of power to, you know, determine where they play and, and if they're paid and whatnot. So um, we're not going backward in college basketball or college football. So if we're not going backward, if you're not going to adapt and embrace the transfer portal and embrace the NIL world and embrace the players have the power, then you're going to get left behind. And Michigan State, I mean, this was not a good year. They had two wins in, in you know Baylor and Illinois. Uh, I'm stunned that they got an eight seed. Like, but I think that that speaks to like the level of nine, nine seed. But yeah, or nine. They were the nine. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that speaks to the level of um, where college basketball is. Where I think we have a you know the top two seed, and you saw it. You know, all the ones and twos made the Sweet Sixteen. There was a big divide this year. Um, so they're fortunate. I think that they had this year, this year, so that their streak could continue. Um, but yeah, I mean, he said it. He has to make changes, and he's right. I, I was told they're pivoting hard on the portal. Begrudging was the term. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, you but, just have to. There's so much talent in the portal they every that. year. And, I mean, guys from mid-majors, other guys from, you know, I mean. Yeah. Trey Townsend. I know that you want your Charlie Bells and Mo Peets and Mateen Cleaves and, you know, you want that. It's you're just it's not going to happen, which is actually what, pretty remarkable you know, I know it's on a smaller scale, but it, you know it's pretty remarkable what Oakland was able to do with the three seniors who played a combined thirteen years there. When any of them could have left true. and gone and played a higher ball, you know, over the course of those years, you know, it's pretty remarkable that they were able to do that. You're not going to see those Flintstone teams anymore. It's just the, which is sad, right? Because that was fun, and it's and it's cool to think about, you know, like Sim City, like you build the city, right? You know, that was a fun game when I was growing up. You know, bu- building the city and watching it grow and thrive, and that's what. It was at Michigan State. It was building a program. Uh, it's just not the way it is anymore, and you, you got to adapt. You adapt or die. I agree, but I think they're they're doing that. They have to. Yeah. Right? And he said he he said as much. Oh, he didn't specifically. Yeah, he said he, he said basically he's going to do everything he can yeah. to get to the get to get deeper. He's going to die trying. Yeah, I they're they're going to do that. They're going into the portal. Thank God. I mean, I I, th- I think I broke that story kind of by accident by saying that. Well, it but it's also a necessity. Like it had to happen eventually. They, but there's people that don't I, I in a coy way put who, it out. Who over there other than Izzo who's stubborn as hell would look at what's happened the last couple of years and say everything's fine. We don't need you know, he's I right. I think he's Izzo right. would say that. He's right. Yeah, they you know, understand. He's right. We don't need to go in the portal. I mean, yeah. Come on. Well, I'll get you out. You and I have a lot of talking to do after the show. We got to get the Trey Townsend. I gotta go. I gotta go, man. You. you we can you talk. Get me here ten forty eight, man. We can talk tomorrow. <laughs> I gotta get the Trey Townsend. We gotta get that off the ground here a little bit. I'm not. You know. I, I, no, you will be. I'll report where he ends up. And uh, no, 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 don't stay out of it. You have a unique position. You're in a Michigan State. I'm not alum. lobbying Trey Townsend to go anywhere. If that's what you're asking, just so. get me in front of him, yeah. and I'll do the lobbying. You, you're. I'm just. I'm actually. Facilitate. I'm just very excited to see what he does on that power conference level, given what 
uh, he did against power conference opponents this year. He'll be great. I can't wait to watch him in East Lansing. Thank you, Tony. You're going to help facilitate that conversation, and I thank Absolutely you. Not. Thanks in advance for that. He he said yes. Uh, ben, thank you. Eric, appreciate you back home. We'll be right back tomorrow, Tony. We got a fascinating episode. I got to cover the entire. Who's on tomorrow? Tom Shanahan, author. He's the expert, foremost expert in Michigan State's role in integration, oh, or well, the yeah. integration of football Back in particular. the 50s, right? Uh, well, the, it got going, really, the 60s, the 60s is when it hit the apex in 66 with the 66 team. National champions, back-to-back years, those were really good teams, Tony. 50s were, you know, they had Willie Thrower at quarterback. There's a painting of Willie Thrower. You know, Michigan State had the first black NFL quarterback. I they put, know. yeah, Willie Thrower. I don't know if I did know that. I, I'll show you the painting on your way out. It's going to be a great one tomorrow. Looking forward to it. Ben, How many episodes has he you. done? This is the first time. He lives out of state. Yeah. I've been asking Slacker. him for like two years. Uh, you, you're, you're, Let's you know, go, I'll come back this summer. We'll talk about where Spencer Torkelson is and where Javi Baez is. If he's at an 88 OPS, uh, I'll be giving you a What macro, OPS man. would be acceptable for Javi Baez at the All-Star break? For, oh, for you to just say, thank God. Oh, it was the sixes, probably. Except, acceptable, like, like, what, like that you against would, the like contract? That you would, against, I mean, like, he needs to be an 800 OPS. No, but I'm saying that, like, where you would be like, at least it's not this. 720. I, I'm, I'm not giving him a back card for 680 because he was at 590 last year. I'm not. I'm not doing it. I don't blame you. Like, he, I need, by the way, 720 is bad. It's below, oh, yeah. below average. I get it. It's slightly below average. 730, I think, is the average. Anyway, appreciate you, Tony. We'll get right, you man. out of here. Thanks, Ben. Get us out of here. Big one tomorrow. Come check us out. Tom Shanahan. We'll see you. Spiro Avenue Show.